Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Look what I got here, the Live Harmony or Lave Harmony DAC. It's a really, really interesting piece. It's fascinating and uh, you may be surprised by some of my conclusions. So sit back, relax, and we'll talk about the Live Harmony. Bridging past and pressing in the glow of autumn light. He holds the future gently like he held the past so tight in the old guy's high fi Everything feels right. Well, everybody's seen the live harmony. It's been reviewed a ton. Um, I'm going to put a little different spin on it. And as I said in the intro, you might be surprised by my conclusions. One of the things that's really interesting is Lave or Live, I'm not sure how they pronounce the name, has given me permission to break the seals and open this thing up and go inside. So you're going to join me. We're going to take a look at the guts of this thing. And it's really fascinating. So the Live Harmony deck is a, an R2R deck. It's high end, $2,700 retail price. It is sold direct from Live. Um, it's a really well-made piece. It's solid billeted aluminum. It's really well constructed. It's very elegant, beautiful design, very legible display, really gorgeous, heavy duty, you know, again, billeted aluminum remote control. Um, and it's kind of interesting. Obviously, it's an R2R ladder deck, and, and uh, I'll get more into the technical stuff when we open it up. But the one thing that's interesting about R2R ladder decks is unlike Delta Sigma deck chips or chip-based decks, not multi-bit, but chip-based Delta Sigma decks, is an r to ladder deck can decode PCM without any oversampling. So 1644, it can decode it without any oversampling. A Delta Sigma chip uh, has to oversample because Delta Sigma only can process a certain amount of bits at a time somewhere between three and six bits at a time. So they typically oversample, and a lot of them oversample at 256 times. And so there's all that switching noise, there's all that sampling noise. And then it's got to be DSP'd and dejittered and all the other stuff, and it all occurs on a single chip. In this, there's actually an analog section and a digital section. And when we open it up, you'll see it inside. And so it's a completely different thing. Now, Delta Sigma chips can do DSD native. I don't think any ladder deck can maybe, but not, not one I found, and I couldn't find specifically on this, but I will tell you that ladder decks traditionally will take a DSD signal and convert it to PCM and then decode it at that point. So on this one, it will do 32768 on USB or I squared S in, and it will accept a DSD up to 256 signal. On SPDIF optical or coax, it'll only do 24192 and no DSD. On I squared S again, 32768 and DSD 256, but I believe it is converted to PCM prior to going through the ladder DACs themselves. Now, the, interest, the unit is really interesting. It uses an Intel Altera Cyclone FPGA chip, and the FPA chip, a excuse me, the FPGA chip does an awful lot of stuff inside. Um, it does digital signal processing. It works in conjunction with the, the Christec CCHD 957 Femto clocks to de-jitter and retime everything because coming in on SPDIF, the, the sending device, that's the clock that determines it, not this. On I squared S and USB, that's asynchronous, and the this clock determines the timing of the data signal. So on I squared S, basically the internal communications amongst all of the componentry inside is done on I squared S. That's kind of machine language. USB, asynchronous USB is a little bit different, but it can be, the nice thing about asynchronous USB is again, this clock times it, but if it detects missing packets of information, it can re-request those be sent, so you get a much better response. Um, so it does have, and I'm, I'll show you a picture of the back because it's too heavy to move. Um, it has balanced out, has single ended out, it has I squared S in, it has SPDIF on coax and TOSLink, and it has a USB B input. Um, it is very well executed, a remarkable product, absolutely remarkable product. And again, Live's given me permission to crack it open and show you guys what's going on inside. So let's go do that now. 
I apologize for the kind of skewed view here, but we're gonna zoom in on this portion in just a minute, and I'll apologize up front for my camera work. So big Toronto power transformer in its own isolated area. That's, this whole case is milled out of a solid billet of aluminum, and it's very, very well constructed. So it's almost like a Faraday cage around there. We've got a tap coming off to run the front display and some of the controls. We've got another tap coming off, and this actually goes to run the ARM processor, which runs the menuing system and so forth. Then we've got the main tap coming off into the power supply filter capacitors, and these are all Rubicon capacitors. And I want you to notice there's a separate tap coming off for basically what's the analog section and a separate tap coming off for what is the digital section. So let me pause, reconfigure, and I'm gonna, we're gonna zoom in on the digital section and then we're gonna talk about the analog section. So here we are zoomed in on the digital section right through here. So we've got USB coming into a galvanically isolated USB receiver. We've got SPDIF coming in on TOSLINK or on coax, and it runs into an AK, uh, AKM chip, an AK44, excuse me, a 4118 SPDIF receiver chip, highly regarded. It'll do 24192. It cleans up that SPDIF signal. And again, because remember, the sending device's clock is what's determining the timing. And so it gets to this AKM chip before it goes off to the Crystec CCHD957 Femto clocks and the FPGA for additional processing. So we've got I2S coming in on I2S receiver. This is the Intel Altera Cyclone FPGA chip, which does all of the basic signal processing and it's supported by some other chips. This is, now remember, R to R DACs don't need to oversample to decode. The latter can do it native uh, PCM. But if you wanna choose oversampling mode and it does give you that, the FPGA handles all the DSP, the oversampling, all of that other stuff in conjunction with the timing and jitter reduction clock circuitry. And then of course we have the demultiplexer, which is it's also called a shift register, which takes the data word, either the 16 bit word or 24 bit word and sequentially feeds it into the individual resistors on the ladder itself. So those chips rely lie here, but that signal sent through this galvanically isolated bridge, these two circuit boards are completely con disconnected from one another. And we're gonna to get to the ladders in just a second. And then it, prior to that, and again, on this side of it is what's called the latch circuit. And the latch circuit's used to ensure that each bit of data is held steady while the conversion happens. So let's move over to the R to R section. Let me see if I can zoom in a little better. I apologize for my bad camera work. So the resistor ladders live inside these gold housings. So now they're isolated, they're uh, obviously, um, kept away from any RF or anything like that. They're completely isolated, so there's absolutely zero noise going on. And again, all of the processing is done on the digital side down, down here, where we were just at a second ago. Let me zoom out and I can show again. All on the other side of this bridge, all the digital processing's there, and then the analog processing, the R to R deck, all of that occurs here. And then it's output to balanced or single-ended outputs. So again, with the way this is operated, the FPGA handles the, the FPGA handles all of the noise shaping, uh, oversampling if needed, and so forth. And it's supported by the Christec clock chips, the Femto clocks. It's supported by the AKM SPDIF receiver. It's supported by an ARM processor, which kind of runs the menu and manages things. And then, of course, the demultiplexer, and I don't know which chip that is. I would imagine they're over here. And then the latch circuit. And the latch circuit lives within the kind of the DAC area by itself. So anyway, that's a look inside the Live Harmony. You can see extraordinarily well built, extraordinarily well laid out. Let me put it back together. We're gonna to go back in the studio. I'm gonna tell you about my thoughts on how it sounds. Isn't that fascinating piece? Well, it's really kind of almost an engineering tour de force inside that thing. It's just so beautiful, well done and elegant, just elegant engineering, just sometimes simple and and is just so elegant and it while it's a very complex circuit it's just the engineering is so thoughtful and so well logical so well laid out and just beautifully done and i'm totally impressed and believe me its performance is in the same category so how did i review this um I did want to make sure I put price appropriate gear with it. So I did use the $11,000 original price, $11,000 Hegel H590. I did use the $6,000 Cambridge Edge A integrated amplifier. I did use the Galleon TSA120 that's sitting over there, which the SE has um, upgraded capacitors and I have upgraded PS Vane Horizon tubes in it. 
I did run it through my ELAC DVR-62s because I know the sound of those. And despite what some people think, speakers will scale, maybe not to a, a beyond three or four times their price, but they will scale. I played it through the Wharfdale 12.4s, but the lion's share the last two weeks um, and all my review time with it, my critical review time was done with the Triangle Magellan Duetta 40th $7,000 stand mount speakers. They're very revealing. And I, you may have seen the review on those already. So remarkable sound. Um, just amazing. It, I don't know how to describe it. And I will at the end. Let, let's talk about some of the recordings. I used a ton of recordings. I listened to everything. I literally for the last two, week, two weeks have been, you know, intimately engaged with this thing for four or five hours a day. Um, and it's just, it was, and it's so rewarding. So one of the first recordings I used was this recording from Joni Mitchell, Blue. And it's a classic 1970s, it's actually 1971 Laurel Canyon kind of folk rock, a very acoustic, very well recorded for 71. Um, just really wonderful. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And James Taylor and Stephen Stills both play guitar on some of the tracks. Um, so it's that, you know, that kind of early 70s, again, folksy kind of rock. Very much Joni Mitchell, but not Court and Spark, a little bit different than that. I mean, her voice is so quirky and idiosyncratic, and her delivery is very kind of off kilter a little bit, but it's just really textured and beautiful, and it's very well recorded. And again, and I tend to gravitate toward recordings like this. I believe all the musicians were in the studio at the same time the recording was going on. So you get a kind of a sense of, of presence of their, you know, a little bleed over from one instrument to another in the microphones and things like that. So it, it makes it very engaging for me. So another great recording, and I'm going to thank old, my, one of my OG subscribers, Ralph, for, for uh, turning me on to this performer. The artist's name is Baden Powell, and the album is called Lembrancas, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. It's a Spanish word. Um, it is Latin guitar, but it's not flamenco. Um, it is amazing. This guy is a virtuoso. He is a true artist. It's very closely mic'd. It's very intimate. I mean, it's almost like you're sitting in front of him literally within four or five feet of him while he's playing the guitar. There are some other accompanying instruments, bongos and flutes and things like that, but it is mostly just him on the guitar solo. And it is so rich and so textured and so nuanced. And this thing revealed so much micro detail. It was unbelievable. And again, I'll get to the summary in a, in a, in a minute. Great recording, just wonderful. I was had not listened to very much Latin guitar before, but now that I'm I have this guy in my playlist, I'm listening to it more frequently. It's wonderful. Just you can hear the strings vibrate after they're plucked. You can hear his fingers and his hands on the neck and on the fretboard. I mean, it just you can hear the body of the guitar. You can hear the individual strings. You can get a get a sense of reverb in the room. It's a little bit of a live room, I think. Just wonderful. So much detail. The next recording I used, I did for fun because I like it, and it's very dynamic and a lot of energy, and it's what I think is the best live recording from the 70s, and no, it's not Frampton Comes Alive. It's Waiting for Columbus by Little Feet. Now, this is from 1977, and this is at a point where the band was under Lowell George's um, leadership or songwriting and performing you know, lead singer. Um, the band had kind of peaked, and they were sort of heading – downhill just because of Lord Lowell George's addictions. But this is a very energetic, it's, the compilation is a bunch of live recordings from various venues around uh, Europe and uh, America. The song I'm gonna talk about was recorded in Washington, DC. And it's the first track, Fat Man in the Bathtub. And there's so much energy and there's so much stage presence and you can hear all of the guys in the band and it sounds like a pretty big band. Um, and again, live recordings are always mono, so there's no sound stage really. They pan it, you know, left or right at the soundboard, but the energy is just outstanding. Now, there's one part of it that I really, really love. I think the organist plays a big Hammond B3 organ, and that has a unique character. And one of the things that they used to do with a Hammond B3, is you could do with other instruments as well, they used to play it through a, a speaker system called a Leslie. And I'll put a picture of one up here. And the Leslie is interesting. It has two horns like this on turntables, and it spins. So it, the horns live in this slot in the top of the speaker cabinet. It's enclosed on three sides, top and bottom. And it has an opening. And as, as they spin, the sound comes out like whoop, whoop. And you can control the speed of the Leslie and it control how fast the wah, wah, wah comes out of there. And it's just so much fun to listen to. It's really, really cool. I just, that's one of my favorite parts of the song. So I'm including it. Another recording I used to get a feel for large scale orchestral piece, large venue, 
get a sense of room and so forth was this recording of Modest Mozagorsky's pictures at an exhibition by my favorite, the Chicago Symphony Order, Symphony Orchestra and Carlos Maria, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, Julie Lini. Um, just a marvelous recording. Um, I love Orchestra Hall. I love the sound of that venue. It's just amazing. And you get a great sense of it. So Anybody my age will remember Emerson, Lincoln Palmer did an album called Pictures at an Exhibition. This is the actual original classical libretto version of it. And I think Mogorsky was a late 19th century, early 20th century Russian composer. And the whole idea behind the piece is he's at an art exhibition and there are paintings on the wall. And obviously the artist is trying to tell a story or convey a message through their artwork. And so he's interpreting what he believes that message is with music. And so it's almost like rock music for an orchestra. It can be very dynamic. It can be crazy busy. There can be so much going on and then it can be real quiet and sweet passages and just very delicate. And so you get that sense. I mean, you have a hundred some people on stage and an orchestra can go literally from a whisper, from a mouth's fart, all the way to an earthquake as far as dynamic range. I mean, a full-on orchestra and a full crescendo can be 100 plus decibels. So it can just from real quiet to really loud instantly too. And there is a lot of that in this recording and this thing kept pace all the way through it. Just amazing. I've not heard anything quite like it. Now, before I do the summary of sound, I'm going to go ahead and cut away because I've been having issues with my camera and the memory card. So there'll be a cut right here. I apologize. I don't know if the camera is overheating or the card is overheating, but I've been having uh, errors right in the middle of, of the recording. So I wanted to break it up uh, at least so I could cut in something else if I had to. So anyway, again, on the symphony, it was amazing. The thing that I loved about it was there are quiet passages. And that when I reviewed the triangle uh, 40ths, the duet of 40ths, I talked about it as well. And it was using this DAC. Um, on the quiet passages, you could hear the individual instrumentalist, maybe one person pay, playing a piccolo or a, a, a clarinet or a muted kind of mournful violin solo. But in addition to all the micro detail in that, you could also get a sense that there were people on stage or actual human beings there. And I don't know how to describe it other than this way. If someone would blindfold you and put you into maybe a bedroom in your home, you'd know you were in a small room. But if someone were to blindfold you and put you in a large gymnasium or a large empty warehouse, you know instantly it's a huge space. We just, we have a, that ability to sense and get the, uh, a sense of the presence of the size and space of a room. And with this DAC and, and, and that particular recording, but many others as well, I got that sense of space and uh, and a sense of the presence of living beings on the stage, all performing. It, it just, I don't know how to describe it other than it was so emotionally engaging and so physically rewarding because one of the things that happens to me when I hear something really beautiful, well recorded, very well reproduced, I'll get goosebumps or sometimes people call it goose pimples, or I think in the UK, they call it goose flesh. There were times when literally for 10 or 15 minutes straight, I was just covered in goosebumps because I was so engaged in the performance and in the reproduction of it through this and the rest of the system that it evoked a physical response for me. It evoked emotional responses too. Just amazing, a remarkable piece. So now I've talked about that. Let's talk about the overall sound quality, and this is going to be real easy. When I did the review of the Chord Cutis, I think I gave it an eight or an eight and a half because I, I said I'd never heard a nine or a 10. I've heard a nine. This is the best DAC I've heard to date. No question about it. It's certainly the best DAC I've had here. And that's going back, you know, I got my first standalone outboard DAC in 1988 in my Marantz CDA 94. And it was actually more expensive than this in the day. Um, so it, I, I've heard lots of DACs. This is by far and away the best I've heard. Uh, I mean, I'm not counting stuff at shows because you can't tell. Uh, having on my hands and having it in my hands and listening to it for extended periods of time and really getting a chance to dig into it. Yeah, this is the best deck I've ever heard. Is it better than the cutest? Yes, it is. <laughs> is it better than the Denifrix Pontus uh, 12th anniversary, Pontus 2 12th anniversary? Yeah, it really is. Is it better than the Gishelli Daisy. Well, yeah, for twice more than twice the price, you would expect it to be. None of those DACs are bad DACs. None of those are flawed. They just have a different presentation and they have a different level of resolution. It is like a Timex watch versus a Rolex watch. They both keep time. A second is a second. 
an hour is an hour. It's just the engineering and the elegance and whatever. The Rolex is a beautifully engineered piece. And obviously the Timex is, a, you know, just a, an everyday, very serviceable workmanlike watch. And a lot of those DAX under the $500 price range certainly fall into that category. They can be quite good. They can be quite engaging and quite entertaining. You get up over $500, now you've got to st start getting some real differences. But none of that is bad. Not, none of those are bad compared to this. They're just different. But this is in a different league. And I don't like to use the word high-end. I will use it in its construction. It is high in its construction. It's high-end in its engineering. And it's high-end in its touch and feel and, and human interface part of it. But from a sound quality standpoint, I don't know that there is a definition of high-end sound. And if there is, it's probably bullshit anyway. Um, I believe that it's up to the individual to determine how something sounds to them. Um, you can listen to a lot of reviewers and a lot of people heaped praise on this, and rightfully so. It deserves it. Um, but there's a lot of good products out there, too, that deserve praise um, that may not be fall into that stupid audiophile category of high-end because it's just because it's expensive. Rant over, I promise. Amazing. So from start to finish, lowest bass notes all the way through to the highest frequencies uh, that I've asked it to reproduce, it did an absolutely flawless job of rendering everything. Nuance, detail, micro detail, big sweeps, large, huge scale uh, crescendos, things like that. It was never flustered. And the good news was, is I had uh, accompanying equipment that didn't get flustered either. This thing just gave me everything that that recording had to give. And I felt like it was, I mean, there's nothing perfect, but I felt like it was the best signal I've ever heard, you know, from start to finish. And again, I'm a source first guy, so that's really important to me. This was the best source I've heard to date. Um, just a remarkable piece, very engaging. I'm going to be sorry to see it go. I can't afford one. Um, I'm not sure I would deserve one, but um, anyway, it is remarkable. The Lave Harmony R to R DAC. High marks, thumbs up, best deck I've heard. No question about it. Hopefully you like the video, and maybe it's the best video you've ever seen. I'm only kidding. If you like the video, I would appreciate a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel, there is a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. There is also a link to join if you want to join the channel, a membership link in the pinned comment and in the description. There is no affiliate link for this live sells direct to consumer. Um, so you can go to their webpage. I will link to their webpage. Um, so you can find it easy if you want to. There are Amazon affiliate links in there, and you know what goes on with those. Uh, my playlists are down there. There will be links to the four albums I discussed during this review in the uh, video description. Um, share with me your comments, your thoughts. What do you think? Um, what's the best act you've ever heard? Um, what is, you know, what's the best sound? What's the best system? What do you like? What's your system like? What are you hoping for? What do you wish for? What are your favorite recordings? Share with me your playlist. I love that the community post is filling up. Go check them out because there's great playlists. And my buddy Ralph and Baden Powell, thank you for that, Ralph. I can't thank you enough. It's a wonderful artist and great recording. So anyway, that's that. Like, subscribe, comment. Please follow me on Instagram if you so desire. Um, I think that's all. My name's Ed Homewood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. And instead of you doing something, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hook this thing back up. And for the next five hours, I'm going to just absolutely immerse myself in the sound of this amazing product. Thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful day.